Welcome, everybody. I'm John Zadar, and this is On Top and Hot. And you've dropped in at a real good time because we have an, inter an interview today with the management from not just one, but two companies that are together. The first one is Barrel Energy, ticker BRLL. -L. The other is China Dongsheng International, though we think of them more as Titan Lithium, ticker CDSG. Now, for all practical purposes, these are sister companies working together in a joint venture in the lithium mining industry. Now, we're going to be covering a lot of great information here, but of course, we can't cover everything, folks. It's just not possible. So I strongly suggest you do do some more due diligence, and you may want to start that by looking at the company's most recent video. It just came out on Thursday, the 18th of January. It is a Zoom meeting. You can find it on YouTube, Telegram, even on the company's website. It is hosted by Penny Stocks Pro, who did an excellent job. Great job, dude. There are a lot of uh, questions he asked that we're probably not going to cover here. So as I always say, the more you know, the more you're going to grow. <laughs> Had to fight the urge to wink there. You know me. <laughs> All right. So with that said, let me introduce you to our guest today. First, we have Craig Alford, the CEO of both companies, and we have Harp. Stanga, am I saying that right? You hit it out of the ballpark. Yes, sir. He, he, is, he is the chairman of both companies. We are glad to have you here today, gentlemen. Thanks. Oh, well, thank you. To be here. Yeah, thank you. So there has been a lot of buzz about your company here recently, primarily because of your properties that you now hold in Tanzania. And we're going to get into that because it is hot. It is looking to be the most Largest lithium deposit in the world, the world's largest. And I mean, that's exciting considering how many lithium mines are in the world and how big some of these are. And we're going to get into that information here in a bit. But first, I want everyone to have a clear picture of the relationship between your two companies so that we're all on the same page. Can you elaborate more on the role each company plays in this joint venture? Who does what? Who owns what? and what the benefits of the joint venture are. So, so Craig and I have been involved in Barrel Energy for a lot longer. We were executives and directors of CDSG, China Dong Sang. And as I mentioned, um, you know, the CDSG opportunity, when it had nothing, was presented to us uh, by Karen Courier and another oh, colleague of hers. And so um, we were invited to become- with Karen. Yeah, directors and officers. And the, you know, we had other things going on with Barrel. And when this opportunity in Tanzania came along, we decided to, to use uh, the CDSG platform as an acquisition vehicle for these properties in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, um, some of the, the technology acquisitions or partnerships that we have in barrel um, have not been consummated yet, but they're coming. And it's really a function of capital. Once we can raise some money, you know, there'll be announcements to that effect. But um, what we did was the properties that we acquired in Tanzania, we decided to split them up. Uh, two properties go to barrel and two properties went to CDSG. Okay. And it meant, you know, that it'd be fair to all shareholders. Okay, all right. Yep. Sounds good. <laughs> now, Barrow has the extraction technology, right? Well, we don't have it yet. We're waiting Okay, for... so they're the ones that are going to harness it when, when it is uh, exactly. gotten. Yep. Okay. Let's see here. I've got quite a few questions here. Let me make sure we've got these in mind. All right. You own more than just the properties in Tanzania. Can you tell us about the other properties you own and where they're at and what you're doing with those? Craig, do you okay. want to discuss the wealth Sure. Plan? Yeah, in terms of the other projects, uh, primarily uh, it's in Nevada. It's right. actually located directly within American Lithium's uh, exploration boundaries for their TLC project, the Tonopah okay. Lithium uh, project. And we have what's called the uh, West End Lithium Project there. And quite frankly, yeah, uh, you can see the yellow line, which is the boundary for American Lithium. 
Okay. And um, the sort of whitish line is the, the main concentration of their resource. And we have that little uh, red sort of rectangle uh, right. in the western section of that. So uh, it happened to be um, a friend of ours who was keeping an eye on claims uh, in, in Nevada that were expiring. He noticed the that they let it expire, so he went out right. and staked it. So it's a nice, important piece of that TLC deposit. Right. And, um, you know, we, we have no working relationship with American Lithium, but hopefully uh, perhaps we can work together and, and, and develop this or, uh, at some point in time. Uh, that would be the nice way to do things because it would make much more sense uh, in that little uh, square. It's, it's actually not a little square. It's a, it's a big chunk. <laughs> right, there. right. Yeah, the productive horizon there dip slowly westward and there are some claims now to the west uh, being held by other companies uh, who've also found lithium resources so it's a it's a fairly interesting area and the TLC project itself is one of the top four projects in Nevada so for CDSG and bro it's a back burner project yeah I mean it's um it's obviously not our, our flagship property, but it's a definitely, it's a good asset to have. And uh, hopefully in 2024, perhaps we can uh, start shaking hands with American Lithium. But again, I want to tell everyone there's no relationship as of yet. So. Right. Understood. Let's and, talk. And John, about I, I, John, I, I might want to add that, Yeah. you know, what, what, you know, you're probably not aware of because if Craig and I, I don't know how many days and, months or hours we spent in uh, the state of Nevada back in 2015, you know, basically turning rocks over, let's just put it that way, looking for lithium assets to acquire. And at that point, there was nobody there really. And we were the founders of a company called Oro Plata Resources, which mm -hmm. then became uh, American Battery Metals, trades on NASDAQ, ABAT yeah. is symbol A-B-A-T. Yeah. And uh, um, I, I give new management a lot of credit, but you know the their thesis to the property they acquired really was instigated by Craig. So, um, and that, and, and that, that just, had a four billion, four or five billion dollar market cap at one point. Yeah, I, and just to be clear, it's ABAT that actually owns the ground to the west of the TLC area. So, um, it's a small world. <laughs> So let's talk about that flagship property because that is what it's all about right now. There's multiple parcels. Um, I think what I love most about the property, and I don't know a lot about it, but the fact that you're not going to have neighbors complaining, that you don't have any of the things we're dealing with in Nevada, from the courts to the, the government, you're free of that. You've got a, your own bureaucracy over there, but you're out there, not to mention the two of you are basically first movers in this region. This country's been known for gold, but ain't nobody been there for lithium. And it looks like there's millions of years of accumulation that you guys are going to be tapping into. And it does sound like a mother load. So give us some insight to what this is all about over there. Uh, Harp, I just want to speak about Tanzania for a second in terms of its, its dance in, in the mining world. I mean, when when you go off to other countries, there's always the aspect of the, um, you know, the risk that you take uh, in, in doing so. Obviously, some countries are a lot more risky, but in terms of Tanzania, it is actually a mining country and they have a very good mining code. Uh, they've always been in the top four producers of gold for Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, South Africa typically is number one, Ghana uh, often number two, and Tanzania has been three or four. Uh, throughout the last decade. And, you know, mining represents a, a good portion of their GDP. Uh, they've got their head on right for mining. Whereas, right. you know, even in uh, jurisdictions within the U.S. and Canada, for instance, mining can be a difficult, uh, you know, task to achieve with uh, environmental laws, uh, with sort of if you're too close to a city, or if you're on some sort of native ground that can cause a lot of issues. Right, absolutely. Uh, if, we, if we look at the Thacker Pass lithium deposit in Nevada, 
it's had a lot of uh, obstacles in the court moving forward. Right. And it, it's still a tough go. It's it's still not, I don't think, out of the all the regulatory uh, entanglements that it, it, it's got itself. Well, out. of all the lithium mining companies in America, you've only got one operational, ALB. And I mean, they're darn near grandfathered in, been there 100 years. Everybody well, else is ready to go. Lithium is, is operational. But Who they're uh, in the Carolinas. Uh, they look they're mining pegmatites, and right. that's not not a huge deposit. So they Piedmont's been quite aggressive at getting out there and making uh, you know some shaking hands and making some joint ventures mm -hmm. uh, in projects in Quebec, Ontario, uh, as well as uh, elsewhere in the world like Ghana. So. Um, I mean, this is what you're going to see, I think. You're going to see the big fish gobble the little fish, right? And right. the medium-sized fish, um, right now, you know, Lithium Americas is not a giant. It's not a SQM. It's not an Albemarle. So right. it might be open to acquisition uh, once production starts. So, uh, but, but going back to Tanzania also, why we're there in a lot of ways is because of Nevada. Our experience in Nevada uh, allowed us to see these environments, these dry desert-like environments. I've also worked in Argentina, where mm -hmm. the, the dry de desert salars uh, produced the lithium brines there. And what we saw in Tanzania replicated that same environment. It, I think your next slide might show a picture of- uh, Oh, I, I don't have that probably lined up. What which it a picture oh. of? Well, I just go to your next slide. I thought it was me digging in the dirt there. So, uh, oh, yeah, I got you digging in the dirt. Uh, but, <laughs> okay. but that was just a big general, also, you know, we're, we're not we're not in a landlocked nation. Um, the next door country to the west of Tanzania is the DRC. The DRC is an awesome country. I've worked there quite a bit too for copper cobalt. And uh, there is a large um, pegmatite lithium deposit there. However, it's virtually landlocked. They only have a very small access to the Atlantic Ocean. And most everything has to be shipped by rail uh, to East Africa. So, And guess where the uh, rail link uh, comes to, uh, John, to Tanzania? Yeah. The port of Dar es Salaam, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, somebody asked that question, um, and his, uh, others said, "Why waste your time asking?" There's that new railroad coming through there, isn't there? Two hundred right. kilometers. There's also an old railroad um, that goes from Dar es Salaam up to Moshi, which is near where we are, and it runs right past uh, uh, Titan One. That's oh, right. so the new one doesn't really make a difference for you, does it? No. 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 <laughs> You're already set to go. So there's that question answered. I mean, by the way, it's totally underutilized. So yeah. Just, yeah. Right, right. So back to Tanzania. I was really impressed. I've covered a lot of lithium mining companies. I don't actually invest in them because I don't understand them enough. However, I understand the potential with lithium. I understand that the market needs more than we're producing right now. And there's just a lot of bureaucracy. But sooner or later, something's going to pop. And I'm sure all of them are going to do well. But to hear that you've got this one, as big as it is, is one thing. But the the results I've been reading are blowing my mind compared to what I've been reading in Nevada. The brine, the lithium uh, carbonate, they're saying that 3,000 is a good reading. So when Surge came out with 7,000, I was impressed. Then I read your report that you actually found a concentration of 22,000 22, parts per million. I mean... That that was outstanding. And then I read that lithium oxide, the gold standard is 1.6. And I read you guys actually found 4.8. I mean, this, yeah. forget about size, the concentration levels there are just outstanding. Sure. So just just for for viewers or listeners, perhaps we step step back one quick, you know, uh, 101 lithium here is that yeah, we have three main types of deposits with lithium. One is the brines. It's basically salty water is a brine. Uh, two is the sedimentary hosted type. And three- hey, hey, Frank, is, let me stop you right there, if you don't mind, just for the audience. What would the ocean be in terms of parts per million? 
Okay, well, the ocean is a brine. Uh, stick your finger, it tastes it. It's, it's a salty water. But it's very, very dilute. I mean, that actually truly holds the most lithium. Uh, the, the oceans are hold the most lithium. However, the concentration is so low in the ocean that ah. extraction is totally uneconomic. Right, it's because so, of the vast amount of volume it has the yeah. most. So, so that's what I was going to talk about next is the three types of lithium deposits, the, the highest grade ones are the pegmatites. But the pegmatites tend to be small and the sedimentary deposits uh, can be quite large. And the brine deposits, well, often it's it's how much area you grabbed because it's, it's literally the interstitial fluid in the rock. So um, the, the brines are kind of like uh, groundwater that people... Yeah, uh, like a salt. And you're just yeah. dissolving it and then sucking that up and then and, and evaporating the, the, the water. Yeah. And the typical extraction method there is to just pump it out onto the surface and let it evaporate. Mm -hmm. um, now, that requires a little bit of a special climate. In, in the case of Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina, um, the, the areas of those brines tend to be high altitude. They tend to be above uh, 12,000 feet, and they have very high evaporation rates. There How is long does it take to evaporate those huge pools? It can take over a year. Um, right. And of course, You're evaporation, awesome. yeah, evaporation rates change greatly. Uh, from season to season. Yep. Uh, during the winter, uh, it's virtually nil. I mean, I, I've lived up there and, um, you know, I had a lot of mornings of, of ice. Um, it gets quite cold. So um, sure. during those winter months, which of course are summer months here in North America, but uh, the evaporate, sorry, the evaporation is very slow. So f if you wanted steady state production, you would be better off with a mine that was in the sedimentary hosted or the pegmatite. Right. And now the right pegmatite now, is more expensive to process. Um, it's a better, it's a better lithium, right? You're, you get better products from it. But well, at, at yeah. the end of the day, I, I, I can't say one is better than the other because we, we're basically looking at an element here, the element of lithium. But um, in terms of what can be produced from the brines, it's a little bit more amenable towards uh, going directly to produce a lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide, which is what the battery ind industry wants, right. where the pegmatites tend to produce a lithium concentrate, which requires further uh, extraction and purification methods to bring it to battery readiness. Right. So, but um, in general, you know, it's, it's more of a, you mine it, you crush it, you concentrate it, and you ship it. Mm -hmm. And that's actually, here. herein comes the big problem for the world, is that where is it going to? And right now, the processing of, of lithium is really uh, done by about three different countries. One of them being China, which has the big, they're, they're, you know, they're the 800-pound gorilla here. Uh, yeah. They're producing most of um, cobalt, most of lithium, uh, refining for battery metals. So if we're going to transition away from oil, it would be sure be nice to have a better playing field than another like OPEC um, controlling the price of everything. Agreed. So uh, obviously there's been a, a great effort um, by the current administration in the US and also in Canada here to develop um, lithium battery uh, plants for for mm -hmm. the new you know electric vehicles to supply yeah. them all the time. Now, just just to go back in time to 2019, there was only two operating plants, and within the U.S. now, I believe 30 are either planned or in in construction. Wow! So that's a giant jump. And well, you're going to need a lot more lithium. I mean, the more plants you build, the more demand that that there's going to be i know yeah. lithium's taking a dip but at this rate it's going to start climbing well you know that's the funny thing about lithium it's it's there's a bit of a tightrope to do right if if it gets too pricey it kind of makes the battery too expensive uh so it 
And if right. it gets too cheap, then it, it sort of curtails production and, and expiration of it. But, you know, I think it'll it'll settle down as, as time goes on. We're, we're going to see a lot of demand. Just uh, across from Detroit, they're building a big plant in Windsor, Ontario. Yes. Uh, yes. It's being built by Stellantis. And uh, the Canadian government has given them $15 billion in tax credits. So it's oh, my a serious God. plan. Uh, as hey, well what's, as what's, the, a, what's that project? And this, is quite, this is quite odd. Uh, there's a project that just got shut down today in Quebec because it was a battery manufacturing facility. But the forest they had to clear to build the facility, the environmentalists uh, have, have got an injunction on it. Oh, there boy. There you go. This is there's so much of that flagship project. Yeah, yeah. Keep going. Okay, sorry. So I, I just wanted to have a like a 101 lithium here before we we're we we're moving forward is to, to understand that there's three major um areas we produce from. Now, in this in terms of the middle one I mentioned, the sedimentary hosted, that's the Thacker Pass, that's the TLC project. Okay, that's what we're currently modeling what we're examining at is, is something that's been uh the you know uh, the result of, of volcanic eruptions um uh, the settling down of volcanic either flows or muds or ash into mm -hmm. a basin and right. then the concentration of lithium over time uh due to it coming out of its source material. In the case of Thacker Pass, it was like little glassy particles called tuff uh, that sort of lent its the, the lithium into the muds over time. Um, and so anyway, those deposits are pretty new and, and they weren't looked at or considered seriously due to the fact that the extraction methods weren't really known well. And that's been the key to the success of those deposits is the final um, sort of technolo technology that's allowed those to be productive. So uh, we're going to see that style of deposit, I think, you know, almost dominating uh, the future. So you are working with the clay deposits, though you have pegamite. You're primarily focused on those clay deposits. We're primarily focused on a sedimentary hosted right now. True. Um, now, when I'm also in, involved in exploration for pegmatites, and uh -huh. just to remind people, like pegmatites are, it's a rock, sort of a plutonic rock. It's uh -huh. like toothpaste. It, it squirts into usually late stage fissures and areas. And it can be quite annoying because you can find something that's three feet wide and then it bulges out to 100 feet wide or vice versa so it can it can be a very difficult thing to ascertain the actual uh size of those deposits and Speaking of size them, deposits i was reading that when they found yours they couldn't find the edges they just kept going out and going out that, trying uh, to find yeah, the parameters well, yeah in nevada for instance you know a lot of people who looked at uh like surge um, is right. a good example. You know, yeah. they went into a valley, they ran some soil testing, and sure enough, they were able to define the the anomaly and then yeah. start drill testing. Yes. So normally, that's not a big thing. You you don't run miles and miles of lines. You you run, let's say, one mile north south, one mile uh, east west, or something, and you've right. you've basically started to define it for drilling. But sure. in our case, uh, going back to uh, almost one year now, our first line ended in mineralization both in north and south. So we decided, oh, let's extend it uh, half again. And it ended in mineralization. So uh, we had to sort of constantly go back and extend and extend and extend, um, which is... Uh, you know, very, it's very nice, but at the same time, kind of frustrating because you want to get to the next phase of exploration, which is the drill. A good thing. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, when you drill too, it's, it's always smart to drill where your highest results are. So you, you can sort of have a nice juicy result to, to sure. release to the public. So, yeah. you know, we haven't even fully defined this thing yet. And um, recently, we've actually looked at some spectral analysis 
Yes. It's called Aster. Um, it's been used. I've actually used it for quite some time. Uh, it's very good at picking out um, clays. And, and clays are often the result of heat sources underneath, like in terms of copper deposits that you see along the, uh, the Western Cordillera of South America. Oh, God, these, thank you work for that. <laughs> yeah, the porphyry copper deposits uh, tend to come in underneath and cook up the, the, the rocks above it into certain clays. And the recognition of that helps you uh, pinpoint tar targets for, for exploration. So we're using a similar style. And mm -hmm. um, Harp, you can mention to this too, that this was done completely independent of, of us. We did not yes. uh, initiate this, this search. And the person who had initiated the search didn't know about us. So yeah, it was uh, a total we, coincidence uh, that we met one another. And it was again through the, uh, our chief geologist in Tanzania, which, which uh, Craig and I discussed his pedigree and background. Um, and he said, well, the, the dean of the uh, geology school and geosciences at the University of Dar es Salaam is doing this study, and he wasn't aware that you guys are doing exploration. It's amazing. Yeah. And you know, what's even more amazing, you've got these great concentrates. You have got the government just turned over, so now it's, you know, a uh, minor friendly jurisdiction. I'm glad you did that due diligence. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> it's really, really wide. But what makes this completely different is its volume, how deep it goes. One of the questions that we were asked is you did most of your drilling to 30 meters. Why didn't you go to 60 meters to hit that big mark? Well, let me well, clarify that. Or you okay. go ahead. I just want to say. Yeah. It's about money, but <laughs> go on, Harp. Yeah, yeah. It's, it is about money. Um, right. Yeah, so to do diamond drilling, it's about, I, I think, Craig, 120, 125 U.S. dollars per meter. Is that oh, correct? 200. 200, 200 altogether. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, uh, and, right, and so, so you multiply it out. and But, I mean, you've got rich deposits just on the surface. We are confident you've got richer deposits even deeper. So I well, mean, that, that's, that's the thesis. And what we did do, and it was it was very cost effective, was we used auger drilling uh, in October, November. Well, actually, yeah, most of October, November, and some of December. And that was a cost effective way, but it only took us to 10, 11 meters. Mm -hmm. And so when we get some of those results... So have you done any guesstimations on what you feel is there? I mean, saying the world's largest, you must have a number in the back of your mind. <laughs> well, okay. We want to be cautious about that, uh, as, as always. Speculation, uh, forward thinking, all that good stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of, of um, barriers in reporting this kind of thing uh, okay. to that, those guesstimate numbers, those, those back of the envelopes. So we try to uh, keep it quiet until they're done. But okay. I do want to say, like, we're looking at about, say, 40 square miles right now, the, the area that we're looking at. So that's a big area. When you consider diamond drilling costing a lot more, we, we would really like to focus, start the focus on an area that's going to give us the most joy. So we haven't yet established that area. Yeah. We haven't right. yet established that area, but when we do, that's that's where we're going to focus. Um, as well, the Aster data has provided us with new areas we have not sampled yet, and that's very exciting to me too. That there are areas still to discover. Uh, currently, uh, what it does show is a very good correlation with what we consider to be the anomaly, the core anomaly. However, there are some areas to the south, north, and particularly to the east that haven't been fully sampled. And the one in the east is a very strong uh, signal um, in the Aster data. So that may show, again, very high concentrations there. So we're excited to get out there and, and take a look at this new area. And if they're not small either. This is... Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. This is really massive and nothing personal but you're a small operation 
And this yeah. is really giant. So I have got to presume that you are presuming there's going to be a buyout somewhere down the road. We 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 are thinking that way, of course. We 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 can't promise anything, but it's right, right. No, no but that's that's the ulti- it's the ultimate exit. Yeah, yeah, well, I would think so. And uh, I guess the next question is: I know. Let's talk about your recent drill results. You you just got a butt bunch of them, right? And you had to send them somewhere to the government or something. Well, no, the, the samples that we collected mm-hmm. from October to December, call it the 20th, and we shipped them to Dar es Salaam. They were uh, put under lock and key, as I said, on the call the other day. Those will be going to the lab, actually three different labs, the University of Dar es Salaam, mm-hmm. uh, the Geological Survey of Tanzania, which would be the equivalent of the USGS, which is the United States okay. Geological Survey, as well as the other government-owned lab, which is called CMAC, S-E-A-M-I-C. And so certain data will be, or or certain results will be tested at the one lab, certain uh, uh, samples will be tested at another, and certain uh, samples will be tested at the other. So there's a lot of data collection going on here. Mm -hmm. And, And keep in mind, when we did these samples, we didn't have the report that Craig referred to uh, which is the Aster spectral data. Oh. Yeah. And and just to mention what Harp was saying about using different labs is this allows us a lot more quality control and quality sure. assurance. Because sure. quite frankly, um, when you get to the stage where you start looking at perhaps building a resource, you want to make sure your data is correct. You, you know, right. to have a double check, a triple check, on the the quality of that data will, will be very helpful moving right. forward. Right, that is the value of the company. That data, I mean, that's you know like a patent. That's that's yeah. what everybody's counting on. Precisely. So, yeah. I mean, it it's one thing too. Like a, to, to go back in time and tell a quick story is you know when I started looking for lithium in Nevada in 2016, I took I ran off and went into a lab in Reno, and and dropped my samples there, and they they hadn't really been exposed to looking for lithium and uh, they hardly knew what to do with a brine sample. So I brought in some brine samples. Uh, right. Like how do we analyze these? So uh, Nevada has gotten used to that now. They're, they're right. getting to be, you know, wow. really uh, familiar with sedimentary style hosted deposits. Whereas mm-hmm. in other parts of the world, like if you were to look at this project in Australia, for instance, they would, they would have no idea uh, of the analytical procedures to do in the lab because they're just pegmatites in, in Australia. Oh, right. And so, so we've we've gone through a bit of a learning process, and and in in hopes of of assuring the public, we're we're you know distributing our samples with three labs right now. So mm-hmm. that that will be very beneficial for everyone. And by the way, Craig, how many people did we ever run into? In Nevada in 2015, 2016, me, you, and my and my son, when we were out there exploring. Other than people we took out there, yeah, yeah, there was no one. You know, it was a. It, it, the funny thing, there was a staking rush, but when it came to actual, when the rubber met the road, there wasn't a lot happening. Um, there was the Clayton Valley and things happening right near the Clayton Valley, mm-hmm. but a lot of other companies weren't drilling. Um, and exploring now they are though i mean you see projects in teal's march and, oh yeah uh, and uh on and on uh, it goes so smoky valley uh things like that so now people are actually uh drilling and understanding what it takes to analyze those sedimentary hosted uh clays um there that was a very novel thing back in uh, 2016 2015 yeah, well, we didn't have the EV surge happening yet. It, I mean, nope. you had Tesla, but I mean that that wasn't a surge. That that was a fetish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now it's necessary. It's a whole different ball game. There's a demand. There wasn't a I demand know. back then, unless you had bipolar disorder or something. You know. Yeah, that, that, actually, that. I wouldn't mind talking about that demand too, because I don't think people realize what a razor thin margin there is right now. Like 2023 was the year 
where production of lithium and the demand for electric vehicles really have kind of paralleled each other. Like they've, they've almost topped out. I mean, first of all, the lithium producers of the world, it doesn't just go to EVs, first of all. You've got right. batteries for, you know, cell phones, power uh, banks, medical ceramics. Uh, you've, I mean, lithium ion batteries are in everything now. Like all no. my, my drill tools and saws and stuff all, are all uh, electric. Um, right. Battery. Yeah, they, they use it for ceramic glazes. They use it to yeah. harden cement. Yeah. They use it to process aluminum. I mean, there's lots of uses for it, yeah. just not as much so, as we need now. People should remember that the electric vehicle growth is actually stealing, in a way, the lithium from those yeah. typical users. Oh, and, right. And if price goes up. All that stuff goes up with it. Well, yeah. And and as I was mentioned, like uh, a lot of people sort of use the idea that there's 10 kilograms of lithium in each electric vehicle, but that's actually not true. I mean, in the Tesla, one of their models, there's actually 64 kilograms. I was going to say, lithium. that sounds light to me. And and there's plans to build large 18 wheel vehicles that would be electric. So the, the lithium demand over the next decade is going to be really something I hope investors can can make a lot of money from. I mean, we're talking about a very um, a, 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 an element that hadn't seen much production uh, mm -hmm. up until about 2016. 2017, it's going bananas. And when I say it's going bananas, the growth is typically 20 to 30 percent maximum. Whereas the demand for electric vehicles has well outstripped that production. So we're, we're getting very close to the time where I don't, I don't see that the price uh, of lithium carbonate, uh, lithium concentrate for spodumene is going to stay low. I, I, I can see it climbing. In I can too. Yeah. I can too. I mean... Now, uh, you are in Tanzania, which is a minor friendly jurisdiction, correct? Yeah, correct. What does that entail to you? What benefits do you get from the government? I know you're paying them a royalty. I know that they got to make sure, you know, you get all your licenses, but what are they doing to actually assist the company? Okay, Harp, do you want to address that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't think that we're not looking for assistance from them <laughs> at this stage. Um, but at the same well, I mean, like in the in Canada, they have a fifty percent expiration uh, tax sensitive. You know, they'll pay fifty cents for every dollar of your expiration. That's yeah, a good that, assistance. And, yeah, and you're referring to some of the flow through dollars that mm -hmm. the losses carry forward to the investor instead of the company. Well, well, Tanzania doesn't offer that. I mean, I think Canada is probably the only country that does offer that. <laughs> um, what Tanzania does offer is stability and an untapped market. And, and they will participate at the government level at the mining uh, at the mining stage. When you're mining, it's written in the mining law that they get 16% of the equity in any project. And, and I think Craig, having worked in so many different countries, the risk always is the government agrees we're gonna take 10%. Well, guess what? It be becomes super pro to 30%. And it's even more profitable than super profitable. Well, you may lose the mine. Yeah, I see they had a ceiling of up to 50%. But I was also reading in that agreement, and tell me if this is applicable to your company. They were saying that foreign miners are required to have 30% of the investors be Tanzanian citizens. There has to be a public offering for them. You, you are allowed to offer it to them. Whether they take it or not is 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 not right. Bad. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, we and should mention. I mean, there there are heavy uh, duty companies working there, like Anglo. Um, so they don't. I mean, Anglo doesn't have thirty percent ownership by Tanzanians and its its parent company and things like this. And right, Barrick Bear, operated quite nicely there for years. So uh, what what we have in in Tanzania. I mean, we've got great access to markets. It's very close to Europe, very close to Asia. Uh, it's not not too difficult to ship things to North America, of course. Uh, we've got good, really nice infrastructure. I mean, 12 years ago, 
Uh, how long did it take to get over to Handini region? Oh, uh, good God. It used to be a 10-hour drive. Yeah, and now yeah. it's beautiful paved roads. Uh, road. Actually, the road along the Titan One project is smoother than anything I've got here in Northern Ontario. Like I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> this is such a nice highway. It really is nice. So and, driving and, to work will be a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. It gets never, and the temperature never get, never gets below zero. So that's the oh other yeah, point. you can we oh. can operate uh, 365 days a year. We have uh, power lines. We have excellent cell phone uh, towers right nearby. Right. Uh, we've got you know the having established a, a mining industry for so so long. Now we also have a lot of professionals in the field. Uh, and just, you know, like the mindset of the government to be pro-mining is you can't even talk about how helpful that is. I mean, every year there's an assessment of mining jurisdictions in the world. And one of the top jurisdictions is Nevada uh, that comes out. And it's more mining friendly than, say, you know, uh, Louisiana or uh, Ohio or something like this. No, it just really goes to show you. It doesn't right. take much. Uh, if you found a deposit, for instance, in Washington State, you might have a hell of a lot more trouble than if you had found it in Arizona. Uh, mm -hmm. And finding a deposit in Tanzania is a lot better than finding it in 90% of the African nations. So, and, 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 yeah. you, know, you know, on a macro level, Craig, I would add, if you take a look at the United States and Canada, the wealth that we have here, you know, all these things like technology, whether it's an Apple computer or Microsoft, I mean, they, they were built on the backs of two industries. And I will say this, for immature markets, which the United States and Canada were 100, 150 years ago, pre-industrial revolution, our strength was we could grow things and we could mine things. And on, on, on the back of those two industries is how we built everything else. And, and we've kind of gotten away from that. But I would say Tanzania, they're welcoming that. Yeah. Oh, I can see why. I mean, they're going to profit from it just as much as everybody else. So, and I guess gold is always popular, but this is an entirely new industry that looks <laughs> to be the biggest in the world. How would Tanzania like to boast that? How's there, China? So are we comparing that to China too? Um, China is not a, a huge producer of lithium. It is a producer of lithium, but it's mainly a um, processor of lithium, a, a, like a, bringing it up to the battery grade and also battery production. Um, in terms of raw materials, uh, you know, like the area of the world I live in, Ontario and Quebec, there's a lot of raw materials, but they tend to get shipped to other places for, for processing. Uh, oil, for instance, in Alberta, there's a plan to build that massive pipeline all the way down to Houston for, for processing. Holy uh, cow. Yeah, that's a yeah, long... John, you being a California guy, you know when you go down the 405 uh, by LAX, there's that gigantic oil refinery. I would say China is is has, owns 80% of that downstream of lithium. The midstream, obviously, isn't applicable in, in Tanzania, but the you know, the upstream, which is exploration, they're, they're making deals to corner that so they can satisfy their downstream facilities. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're, so, they're, they're the refiners. Yeah. So let's speak a little bit about funding to keep you going. I realize we don't have to fund the entire project. We don't know how big the project is, so you can't do that yet. We just need to get to the next step like in baseball, just progress base to base. We don't need a home run. Correct. Yeah. How, how is our funding laid out right now? Do we have any investors jumping on board? Any prospects? How's that going? We're talking to some major miners. Uh, unfortunately, none of them are North American. Uh, we're hoping that they show up at some point. These are all international players. They visited the site. Uh, we're under uh, non-disclosure agreements with them. We expect to be following up with them again in February. But in the meantime, you know, we, we push things along on the basis of how much money we can raise today. And it's normally non-dilutive. It's usually money Craig and I find personally or family, friends, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we don't have to slow down. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And in terms of uh, drilling, as we mentioned earlier, it's not like 
we have to attack everywhere at once. It's smarter right. to start at the core, the perhaps the juiciest area we can, uh, build up good results, and then raise money on that. And that hopefully leads to the next uh, plateau uh, of the stock going up and then doing another raise. That way, it's really non-dilutive. And using that same logic, we're working from CDSG being the right hand to BRLL being the left hand. We're going to build up the right hand that will lift up Brill later. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, take, taking yeah. care of too much at one time just spreads you too thin. You, like you said, let's make it juicy. Let's make everything we do count so we're solid footing. Then we yeah. can lift other things up when we're secure. Yeah, yeah. funny enough, I mean, there's, there's no room for wasting of money here. No, yeah. no, no. Uh, yeah. You know, something that just popped into my mind. I was, I was thinking about your financials. I read um, Karen Courier is your CFO. And yes. I myself, I am pretty familiar with Karen Courier. She was kind of a hero a few years ago. She was going over to the expert market and getting custodialship of these companies, which were recognized during the run of February 2021 that had no management, no financials, been there for 10 years with nothing. And here she comes along cleaning them up and puts them back on the market. She was excellent. And I see she's on your team. What is her purpose on your team? Well, I mean, she, number one, presented us the opportunity to come on the board and join her. And and, and obviously, you know, uh, through reputation alone, um, we believe that she could be an asset and and vice versa. And right. essentially it. And, and, you know, she had the faith in Craig and I that we'd find an asset for this company that she cleaned up. And as they say, here we are. Yeah. Is she your accountant, by the way? I noticed she does a lot of accounting. Yeah, accounting and CFO. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So she's got two offices. Good for her. I like Karen. I heard she had some family problems a while ago, so I hope she's doing okay and her family's all right now. Yeah, much Great. better. Thank me. Harp, you might want to mention the Form 10. Uh, yeah. Yeah, bring that up. Yeah, so on Thursday, we finally did get our Form 10 submitted uh, to the SEC. We're mm -hmm. expecting comments, I would say, the first week of February. And hopefully, you know, a lot of these comments that the SEC addressed in our first uh, uh, submission to them have been answered. And, you know, we're just looking forward to the day that we're SEC effective. And yeah, a lot of the other uh, uh, online trading platforms can take buy and sell orders and take deposits and and, and we're looking forward to yeah. that. Yeah. It's very important, you know, that one thing is we had our heads really on expiration and and, and trying to find a, a quality asset. But finally, we've, you know, we've had to uh, face the, the wall of the SEC and, and get over that hurdle. So right. uh, that'll, that'll really help us in, at the institutional level uh, within North America hopefully attracting institutional investors here. Right. Absolutely. Well, I think the more test results you have, that's going to be everything. I mean, these guys are monitoring all the mines out there, I'm sure. And you've got some results that blew my mind. And I'm not even a miner. I'm not investing in them right, right now. So I'm sure that's going to be impressive. Something we haven't touched on to at all is your share structure. And I, as an investor, making a video for investors, have to ask the one crucial question, especially in this market sentiment. Do you guys have any plans for a reverse split? No, not at this point. <laughs> I hate asking, guys, but we got to get that out there. I've been hit with 51 of them in the last 18 months. Ooh, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's this stuff about the prices even. No, no, you take a big hit. Your average price of your shares goes sky high. So I'm glad to hear that. Do you have any plans to change your structure in any way? Uh, at this stage, no, nothing. And I don't mean at this stage that we're going to change our minds, but I actually mean that we've got pretty good liquidity considering, right? Um, you know, there's not a lot of FOMO in the OTC right now. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're just building up the assets and at some point we'll be rewarded for it. And Harp, you might want to mention, you know, you've cleaned up a lot of the notes that were outstanding. 
That's right. And, uh, yeah. That's so as I'm, really I, I'm gonna, I did mention this on the Zoom call the other day. I mean, there's a finite number of shares now. Um, there was this risk of some note conversions, and, and literally, it was in the hundreds of millions, and mm. that got basically uh, killed, you know, and yeah. just before Christmas. So there's no more conversions left outstanding, other than Fantastic. some fixed price conversions, which essentially. You know, we're not too stressed about, and it seems like shareholders aren't either. But it's yeah. it's it's the the ones that require der derivative calculation, and these death spiral type notes. Mm -hmm. There's no more outstanding like that. So I just want to say, even though we've been a little quiet lately, you know, cleaned up the corporate side. Um, we're refocusing on the exploration side for 2024. So hopefully, we're we're going to be in a lot more clear sailing. Uh, in this year it it was there was some there were some very stressful days <laughs> but yeah no uh, kidding heart, sorry to hear that pick up notes and uh you know we're dealing with the sec Those are great and, accomplishments uh, you've got to be yeah. sleeping a little better now we are yeah <laughs> yeah so it's it's looking I've forward got a to question the here from a uh, twitter uh viewer nemo 17 uh, will CDSG change their name and will Brill have a working website? Well, the website will be up tomorrow <laughs> on Brill. Um, wow. How's that for a reply? <laughs> um, uh, with regard, well, what is it? Sunday, tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow, Monday, it'll be up. Um, as far as the name change, uh, until we're SEC effective, mm -hmm. FINRA won't look at the name change. Yeah. We put in for a name change, but we had the cart before the horse and yeah. we have to get fully compliant first. Then right. we can proceed. Yeah, because the, the name is not helping. <laughs> so. no, no, like I said, that, it it doesn't bring lithium to mind. It just isn't the first thing, second or even third thing that comes to mind. So yeah. I'm glad you do have a new name out there. Uh, let me see here. Going through my questions, see if there's anything I mixed. Um You've got complete 100% interest now in Titan 1 and Titan 2. Hoorah. Excellent uh, drillings so far from what we, we see without any official feedback yet. Um, the one thing I guess we haven't touched on to, and again, it's a projection, I know, and I'm not holding to anything. Don't you hold into it either, folks. What? How long down the road do you think it'll take before we see any actual operations in Tanzia? Well, I think I'd like to address that. And I got to go back about three, four minutes as to what I said. This is all, and Craig said the same thing. It's all a function of money, right? Um, we, we speed up and we slow down based on the availability of money. Mm -hmm. So so to give you a prediction, um, I'd have to also come up with a budget, you know, based on what Craig thinks. Right. So that's a really difficult question. I'm sure. It is. Are, are we talking a year, five years, 10 years? I okay, just in, in terms of the typical mine that you see here in North America, yeah. it's a decade, but we are going to try to accelerate uh, everything as fast as we can. Um, right. I think it's really important to remind investors that there, what we have in Tanzania is called a prospecting license, and it's actually a lot more advantageous than you get here in North America, where you'll have a a mining lease or a mining license, and then you have to apply for permits for work, uh, permits for drilling, um, permits for this, permits for that. Whereas here uh, in Tanzania, I, wanna, I should say here, uh, in Tanzania, a prospecting license actually covers all those things. So you can actually go to the stage of almost a pilot plant in, in right. Tanzania um, with within that same license without having to reapply for any further licenses. That yeah. helps a lot. Oh, yeah. That Forget helps. about the extra yeah. expenses for all the license. It's just that you're, you're not having the bureaucracy of waiting to apply right. for every license. Exactly. And, you know, the approval process sometimes can be months and months for, for uh, uh, drilling. And then sometimes if you drill too much, you can get penalized. So we don't have that obstacle ahead. <laughs> We're also, we're not on any sacred lands. Uh, right. We're not on any um, 
lands that are of agricultural use or really human use for the most part, uh, they're dry and dusty and 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 pretty much in, uh, very and inhospitable. I would presume that Tan Tanzania is is also eager to get things going. I mean, if it took ten years to get it going, you're yeah. going to miss the lithium surge. Ten years from now, we've already gone up and leveled out. So yeah. I would think that they'd be eager to get a big piece of that pie as soon as they can. Oh, yeah. Well, let, let's actually just want to mention too that uh, lithium is not the only battery metal that uh, Tanzania is going to be known for. It has graphite deposits. Right. Uh, right Tesla has right. actually taken an offtake agreement with one of the graphite deposits in Tanzania. Uh, it has nickel deposits, and uh, there's a what is the name of the company? Harp? Do you remember? Oh, it's. Uh... Uh, I always forget its name because it's not Manga, like Manga Nickel, but it's changed its name as it's public. Uh, one yeah, of I got two things. pages. Is it, is it in your uh, deck? That's no, it's not. A... So, yeah. ah, right. If somebody has a quick search, they can do uh, Manga Nickel, new owners. It's listed on NASDAQ. Um, and it's headed by probably one of the most famous mining financiers and promoters in the world, Robert Friedland. Life Zone Metals. Light zone metal. That's, that's what it's called. Yeah. I always forget its name because, you know, you use life zone it's so, metal. It's so unrelated to nickel. Yeah. But, but this is, this is the, the sort of the core now of a lot of this new industry in Tanzania is around these critical elements, battery elements. And um, sure. I, I, I can't remember the exact date, but uh, Kamala Harris, the VP for the U.S., visited Tanzania. About a year ago almost. Yeah. yeah spoke directly about this. So uh, I'm hoping that there may be some agreement uh, in the works with the U.S. and Tanzania um, right. uh, regarding, you know, uh, the supply chain for, for these critical uh, elements. So um, we're really looking forward to that uh, progressing on all fronts. So, uh, you know, graphite's extremely important. Uh, nickel's extremely important. Lithium's extremely important. Right. Tanzania is basically becoming a hub for transportation from anything from the DRC. Uh, so it's 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 going to be a, a growing part of their economy. Is this uh, lithium? Nickel. Yeah, if you make a list. It's exciting for you. I mean, the fact oh, yeah. that you are literally first movers into this zone, which looks to be the world's largest. I mean, that that's. That in itself is a feat. You're, you're probably going to go down in the book somewhere. You are the two guys that discovered this. <laughs> You'll be in the history. The geologist <laughs> from America that discovered the largest lithium deposit in Tanzania. Harp, I you think know, it was... it, it, it's funny enough. I mean, I get a lot of calls from, from shareholders why the share price is up or why it's down. And I just constantly remind people, you own a call option on lithium. Without an expiry date. <laughs> I yeah. like that. Yeah. I think investors need to always remind themselves the stock price has nothing to do with the management. That's all investors. That is us. You guys do shareholder value. We do stock price. So once, you know, if you guys could do something about the price, you wouldn't do reverse splits. You know, it's just a simple right. answer right there. So I think it's a shame that you should ever get a call about the stock price. That's not your department. Look in the mirror, guys. Come on. Yeah. And, you know, we haven't, how much money have we spent on promotion? I mean, $10? I mean, we have not <laughs> yeah. really promoted ourselves at all yet. So we wanted to ensure that everything was good with our licenses. Everything is good mm -hmm. on the corporate level. Uh, fully SEC reporting, and then we can start that kind of, uh, you know, promotion machine. Kind yeah, it looks like you're, you're ready to move to the next gear right now. Your test yeah. results coming, licenses acquired, you know, you're, you're right there Fair going team. to the next step. Yep. I like it. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything we didn't cover, gentlemen? I know I covered a bunch here and there, but have you got anything on the back of your mind? Uh, that maybe I didn't even know about that you might want to share with the investors? I just, I want to speak quickly about, I think the lithium price right now. I mean, it has sagged a bit, but um, I, as I said, I'm uh, maybe repeating myself a little bit. Uh, electric vehicle demand is not slowing. 
Uh, there are problems right now in places like Chile, which is a big lithium producer. Yeah. Uh, just recently, the the largest lithium uh, producer in the world uh, has had to stop due to issues, uh, local issues in Chile. So, really? I mean, I, I see that 2024, we should see a nice price rebound. I know that things like lithium ETFs haven't performed well, but I think people should pay attention. And, and now, you know, when, when there's a lull like this, that's the time to, to move. That's I, right. For many years, I've been in gold exploration, and it always kills me that everybody waits until the price is high to start investing. Get in. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like, no, people, pay attention when the price is low because this is the calm before the storm. So Yeah, yeah, the buying frenzy should be there. I think the fear of it dropping more, you know how you alleviate that? You don't buy everything at once. You get 30% if it drops more, you celebrate because you get a better price and you get some more. You know, if you buy everything at once, it has to go up or you're having a bad day. Yeah, Lithium is going to rebound. There is no doubt about that. No it's not going to I mean, rebound. It's going to surge. Yeah, it's going to next surge. decade, just even the next five years, they're anticipating tripling of EV sales. So if you if you think about what that means for mines, there's no mine that can triple its output. It's just impossible. And as the right. mines have increased its output, it's typically 20% year on year sort of uh, in increase in output. So it's hard for the mines to keep up with demand here. And, and the next decade, uh, there's a lot of countries that have, you know, political mandates out there uh, to get rid of uh, internal combustion gas vehicles. Right. So yes, yes, yes. Um, ICE, ICE is, is the acronym, but so I think China is the first one, 2025. Yeah. 2025. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they've got something like 200,000 electric buses. Think of the batteries for them bad boys. They oh, got, I, know. I yeah. mean, that's in how many kilograms cars are worthless now, and they've right. got to replace all their cars while the buses are driving them around until mm -hmm. they can do it. I always, I always think back to when you first saw cell phones. Yeah, you saw a guy at the end of the bar with a great big cell phone in his hand. Yeah, and it cost twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah, and yeah, and you saw, you saw one or two cell phones a day, and now there's in each household there's probably three cell phones. Yeah, you know, teenagers have them. My well, well, kid, Craig, what about your Christmas gift to yourself? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it just it just goes on and on like. I, I the electric vehicle that shows up down the street, uh, you're going to see another one, and you're going to see. That's what I'm saying. You, you, they they're going to start popping up like cell phones did, and then the next thing you know, they're everywhere. Well, um, the TV, so the TV Craig bought is 86 inches. It's yeah, just idiotic. It, they make idiotic. Them right now, huh? Good God, they're they're going to have theater size. You just unfold and put out. My oh, God! Yeah. <laughs> and how much was it at Best Buy? You were saying six hundred bucks. It was a thousand dollars. Like it's oh. it was so cheap. As, I as remember when the eighteen inch came out for three thousand dollars. The flat screen right. TV. Oh yeah, well, you wouldn't have even like you would have had to mortgage your house to buy a eighty six inch TV. Yeah. Not a decade ago, right? You would. It'd have been a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, exactly. So. You know, that's another thing about electric vehicles is that, you know, right now they're still in a way a luxury brand, like a luxury item. So when they start being common, when we see, you know, Ford's got a lot of ambitions this way. GM's got a lot of ambitions this when way. When you see chargers from coast to coast covering metropolitan cities, when they have power to go wherever they want to yeah. go. That's when they're going to buy the car. They don't want to get trapped somewhere and not be able to charge up. Precisely. I mean, um, in North America, I mean, we're a little bit different than the rest of the world. Like, if you look at Europe, you've got city after city after city fairly close by. So you're never out in the boonies, right? You're, right. you're not in, stranded in the middle of nowhere. I've got a long way where I live between cities. And, yeah, you get range anxiety. Uh, <laughs> electric vehicles. Yes. But and also, you know, the charging timing, too. I think these these little parts of the technology 
the infrastructure, first of all, also um, people who are developing better batteries, faster charging rates. All this is going, going hand in hand in the next decade that will uh, sort of assure uh, the dominance of electric vehicles. Of well, as you were saying, the extraction technologies is now being evolved because we need it. We need to come up. So as time goes on, we're going to keep making things more improved, more necessary, more needed, more efficient. It's the market is going to explode, you know, and yeah. even if we go to hydrogen, ultimately that is way down the road right now. Lithium yeah. Is strong. yeah. It's actually, you know, it's a really good mental exercise is imagine we were all driving electric vehicles and I tried to convince you to drive a gas vehicle and you were yeah. to ask me, what, what does it take to get the gas? And I'd say, well, I got to go, a uh, hundred miles offshore, uh, build a giant metal platform and, and drill down three miles. Um, and then, you know, hopefully nobody dies in the stormy seas and we transport that uh, flammable product around the world and in pipelines. You would think I was crazy. You would think, whoa, why? That doesn't make sense. Electricity, uh, we have electricity in every city. Uh, why not just hook into the grid? And then, you know, another interesting criticism of electric vehicles is that, oh, where's all the power going to come from? And I always say to people, you know, that subdivision of 200 houses they just built, nobody ever asks, where's all the power going to come from for those houses? They put up a new tall super, you know, skyscraper. Nobody ever says, where's the power going to come from? But when, when three or four people on my street buy an electric vehicle, everyone's like, oh, where's the power coming from? Well, you know, yeah. the fact of the matter is all these metropolitan metropolitan cities were not metropolitan cities at one point. Towns grow. Where did the yeah. power come from? So they, they they got that big. The power yeah. company grow with them. So That's right. they, well, the power yeah. companies meet the demand. For yeah, right. they do. It's, it's, and, you know, at the end of the day, too, I mean, you know, uh, there's a lot of like I met someone who who's an Uber driver. And they say it's was less than hundred dollars a month, and that's driving their electric vehicle, you know, twelve hours a day, and that's cheap compared to gas. So yes, there's a lot of saving, saving for people. hundred a month. A hundred a month. He said that was the only effect it had on my electrical bill. Wow. You know, but charging things like charging at night, where you know power uh, is cheaper, and things like that. Right. I mean, it's going to happen. A lot of people are they'll adapt. I mean, and at the end of the day, you know, another good thing for people to think about is when you see a traffic jam, think about how many gallons of gas are being burnt in traffic jams around the world on a daily basis. You know, traffic jams in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, uh, Toronto, Ryan. started producing cars that night. turned off and weren't idling there. Over in Scotland, you're not allowed to park and idle. If you're parked, you better turn your car off or you're going to get a ticket. It's well, just, yeah, it's yeah. these newer cars where they, it just shuts off when it realizes you're at a red light. But, yeah. but I just want to say as a geologist, it actually hurts my feelings to have gone to the effort of finding oil, uh, you know, pumping it up, transporting it, refining it, and then it's just burnt in a traffic jam somewhere. It's just... Oh, yeah, your feelings are hurt. Your bank account is exploding. <laughs> I'm feeling for you, buddy. No, I no, think but... the oil industry's had its day, and it's not like oil industry's going anywhere. Oil, like lithium, like everything, has multiple purposes. It just isn't going to be gluttonized in vehicles anymore. It'll be in other areas. Yeah, and we yeah. need that. It's about and, time. And, yeah, the transition to electric vehicles will take time. I mean, I other countries like China and and the Europe Union will be ahead of us simply because of their infrastructure. And there's not a big propensity in China, for instance. I, I used to live there. People don't go, oh, let's drive uh, 800 miles across country. They don't do that. It's, it's very rare. They stay within their own cities. Um, we're the crazy people that take these long cross-country trips. And yeah. We love it. Well, oh, we it's love fun it. being trapped in a car with somebody for seven days. We love our road trips, right? We, we, we really 